Number five, the Shadow Doll. Coming up on the number five spot today is part of the collection owned by the late Ed and Lorraine Warren, big top five scary fan favorites. One of the first items you'll see when entering the Warren's Haunted Museum is this terrifying little shadow doll made of bird feathers and real human teeth. The Warren's son-in-law and current proprietor of the now defunct museum, Tony Spera, offers a little bit of insight on the doll, saying it was originally acquired at an antique shop where it was being sold, with the owners of the shop being none the wiser of the doll's evil. That's completely on the antique shop owner though. You know, you come into a possession of a doll made of bird feathers and human teeth, your first instinct should not be to stick a price tag on it. You should toss it into the ocean or burn it, something like that. Sparrow claims that the doll's curse works by taking a photograph of the doll, and then when it develops, you write the curse that you'd like to inflict on the back of the photo, and you send that to your victim. And the person who opens the envelope and sees the doll in the photograph will invite the curse into your home. Now, probably a lot of pictures of the shadow doll behind me, or pictures of the shadow doll being interspersed in this video right now. I just want to tell you, I don't have any curses in mind. I didn't write any curses down. I don't have a negative thought inside my head, buddy. I barely have thoughts inside my head as is. If I would curse you with anything, I would curse you to always find loose change, always get texts back from your crush, and I'd curse you to always make the right amount of pasta. I'd only curse you of good things. Now the real question I have to ask about this scary shadow doll is do you think it's jealous that it's not the most famous haunted doll in the Warren's Museum? I know I would probably have a very hard time sitting next to Annabelle all day. Everyone's coming to gawk and take photos at my movie star sister. Ugh, hard life. Nobody's gonna make any movies about me. No wonder that doll was cursing people. And if you're looking for more stories about cursed dolls, I've got lots and lots and lots and lots of those. But I've got lots of other scary things too. Aliens, ghouls, goblins, conspiracies, just about anything you can think up. I've done a video or two on it. So hit subscribe. Please make sure you hit that little bell as well. That means you get every one of the videos we make. But do that at the end of this video if you wouldn't mind. Because I got four more crazy cursed objects coming up for you right about now. Number four, cursed ballista balls. Like the last couple years had everybody acting pretty, pretty strange. I think it was unprecedented times. Maybe you binged all of Tiger King in a day. Maybe you got really into making sourdough. Maybe you returned a cursed artifact you stole when you were a teenager. We all went through some personal development. In 2020, a source that chooses to remain anonymous returned an ancient artifact that they'd stolen as a teenager to the Israeli government a Bronze Age ballista ball fired during the Great Jewish Revolt by the Romans. The thief swiped them as a teenager when visiting with a group of friends and went on to live a fairly normal life, a successful career, found a partner, sired some children. Throughout his entire life, he felt as if there was a weight over him, as if he had some invisible presence of guilt weighing down on him forever. And he said no matter how long it had been, or how much his life had moved past this childhood act of delinquency, his heart could never move on from it, and he felt as if he'd been cursed to forever bear the guilt of it. During the events of the last few years, he said it stirred in him this apocalyptic feeling that made him want to return the ballista balls in the hopes of finally clearing his conscience. Do you think at any point during all that, during all that fun stuff during the quarantine and everything, do you, do you think he was ever worried that he might have accidentally done it by moving those ballista balls and that's why he had to put them back? Through Facebook, he ended up getting put towards the right channels within the government to return it. But you know what's really bizarre about this bizarre story? This isn't even the first time this has happened, because in 2015 an almost identical story played out. In 2015, two ballista balls were returned to Israeli authorities alongside a note stating, I took these in 1995 from a residential quarter at the foot of the summit. They have brought me nothing but trouble. Please do not steal antiquities. Well, I've got to say it's a nice change of pace to hear about people trying to undo a curse before anything got too heated. And you know what? I like these stories. It's a very easy to follow message for those of us listening at home. Don't steal antiquities. Unless you're Indiana Jones, that should be some pretty easy advice to follow in your life. Number three, the crying boy painting. Some of my favorite cursed objects are a good haunted painting. Maybe it's because I had a huge fondness for Ghostbusters 2 as a little guy and it's got a haunted painting as the main bad guy of that movie. Maybe it's just because I'm very enticed by the uncanny valley of a pair of eyes that you can look at but can never look at you back. We'll probably uh, mention that in therapy next time. Anyway, case in point, take a look at this painting, the crying 
Dying Boy. Looks like a fairly normal painting, wouldn't look too out of place in your dentist's office. It's not really my kind of art, but I'm sure a generation of grannies love to put this in the parlor. It's been the center of a series of strange coincidences that are just too darn odd to be true. It was painted by an Italian painter, one Giovanni Bragolin, and mass produced as a print across the 50s, so everyone could enjoy this sad crying boy in the comfort of their own home until they would burn down. Because for some bizarre, possibly paranormal reason, firefighters around Essex, London would report that frequently, amidst smoldering ruins of a burned down house, repeatedly they would find the crying boy painting completely untouched by the flames even when everything else had burned to ash. Now, this happens once, that's bizarre. Two, very strange. If this happens three times, you've got yourself an outright paranormal mystery on your hands. The British tabloid The Sun loved the story and was spreading stories of the cursed paintings like a house on fire. Too soon? The Sun printed out warnings of people who owned the painting and that they should get rid of it, lest they find themselves smelling smoke. The story was so popular and people were so invested in the curse of the crying boy that The Sun tried to take it upon themselves to rid London of the curse by, get this, holding a bonfire in which anyone who owned a print of the cursed painting could come, torch it, and hopefully exercise whatever demons had got into the printing press. The bonfire was a raging success, with sackfuls of the prints being torched, seemingly ending the curse of the crying boy. After hearing about this story, though, does anyone else kind of want one of the prints? I don't know. There's just, there's something about it. Number two, the Hope Diamond. The Hope Diamond has shown up more than a few times on this channel, and for good reason. It's considered one of the most haunted rocks on the planet. The diamond was first uncovered in India, with reports purporting that the diamond was plucked from the eye of a statue of the goddess Sita, the goddess of beauty and devotion. Legend has it that the first person who stole the diamond was mauled by dogs shortly after taking it. That's a pretty quick curse. From here, the diamonds passed through countless hands, never staying in one place for too long. It's said to have been owned by King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, who as far as I know, never had anything too bad happen to her. Nothing worth losing your head over worrying about. That's a little, uh, little history joke for you. Throughout the diamond's storied history, it's been said that just about every owner suffered a horrific fate. 14 confirmed deaths and owners throughout history, and that's only the ones we know of for sure, as there could be countless more. The jeweler who recut the stone into its current form, William Falls, died a ruined man in poverty and hardship. His son Hendrik stole the stone from his father, who would later be prompted to take his own life for the crime. After passing from owner to owner under grisly circumstances, it made its way to Harry Winston, an American jeweler who possibly making the only good choice of anyone on this list, thought it better to play with his odds and donated the diamond to the Smithsonian Museum in 1958, where it currently resides sealed away. The curators of the Smithsonian were thrilled to receive it and have said that they consider the gem a crown jewel and that in all the time it's been in their watch, no one has suffered any ill effects. Maybe Indiana Jones was right. It belongs in a museum. That's, that's too many Indiana jokes in one video. Too many Indiana jokes. I'm just, I'm excited about the new one. I can't believe old Harrison Ford's coming back again for the millionth time. He's always coming back. Number one, Robert the Doll. Every good list of cursed objects should definitely include one cursed doll. I know we had the shadow doll up there, but that was like a starter curse doll. We got better ones. So that's why we're going to finish up this list for today with a classic haunted doll. Dolls are just inherently a little bit scary when they're not being used for make-believe, and they're especially scary when they carry a series of unfortunate urban legends with them, like the case of Robert the Doll. Maybe you've even heard of Robert the Doll, maybe from this very own channel, maybe from this very own host, because I mentioned him in the first video that I ever did. It's all full circle. He's one of the more notable cursed dolls out out there. If you're in the cursed doll community, you probably know him. Robert has been haunting for over a century. He used to be the property of one Robert Jean Otto, although he shared a name with a doll he preferred to be called Otto. Maybe because of the doll he wanted to be called Otto. Anyway, Otto received Robert as a boy from his grandfather who obtained the doll through unknown means. Trying to trace wherever it came from has proven fruitless as no toy company has ever been found to have produced it. Now the young Otto loved Robert and had a very active imagination to a degree that would unsettle his parents 
parents. He would refer to the doll in first person and brought it everywhere with him, even dressed it in his own clothing. Otto would say that he would hear Robert talk to him and would see him move. Children who passed the homestead when walking by would say that they claim that they saw Robert in the windows watching them. Otto would blame all these mishaps on Robert. Injuries, breaks, anything that happened, it was because Robert had told him to do it or that Robert the doll had done it. And this behavior kind of understandably deeply worried Otto's parents. Otto kept Robert until the day of his death in 1974 where he then traveled from home to home causing a path of misfortune wherever he went until he eventually found himself in the Key West Art and Historical Society, where he's now kept under very tight lock and key and has become the museum's most popular attraction, where visitors leave him offerings, treats, and even writing letters asking for protection or for him to curse others. Employees of the museum say sometimes they feel uncomfortable around him and have noticed a chill in the air by his seat or electrical malfunctions near where he sits. It's been said that they need to stay on his good side lest they provoke his wrath. Maybe it's a good thing then that he's locked up tight in that glass last case and there's just something about this guy and Robert, Robert the doll, if you're watching right now, just want you to know all that stuff I was saying, I was just playing. You know we're friends, you know we've always gone together, you and I. You know I'm a big fan of the scary doll community, I just wanted to make it clear, we're cool. In fifth place we have a satanic idol. This story began in 1991 when a deer hunter was walking through the woods in Connecticut, close to where Ed and Lorraine resided. The hunter got lost and after some time stumbled upon a raised circular rock formation with the idol in question, standing in the middle of it. It is believed that the formation was common with folks who practiced devil worship in the 70s. The hunter began to feel uncomfortable and left the area, deciding to make his way back to his car and along the way he noticed an elderly gentleman walking alongside him who was dressed in head to toe black. The man in black never spoke a single word to the deer hunter. Now the hunter was getting more nervous by the second, and also more lost, and unsure of his directional path. Desperate, he turned to the mysterious figure and simply asked, how do I get out of here? Luckily for our narrator, the man in black pointed in a direction and then disappeared. The hunter was so thrown off by that day that he reached out to Ed, who requested to be brought to the same area. Now the hunter wasn't 100% sure he could find the exact location, but was willing to try. Together, the two men were able to stumble through the forest, and without the aid of the man in black this time, found the rock from. Ed removed the demonic idol from the area and placed it in the museum and that's when things got a little weirder. Approximately three days after removing the idol, Lorraine collapsed for no known reason and she was transported to the hospital where no one could identify what was wrong with her. Thankfully, after three more days, she recovered. Now Ed believed that this was caused by the gentleman in black who was believed to have been a high priest in a satanic cult as a form of payback for removing the satanic idol. In fourth place, we have a conjuring book. So one night after returning home from a night out with Ed, Lorraine was reviewing the calls left on the answering machine when she found one from a distraught woman who introduced herself as a Mrs. Sandy Foster, who nervously described a very distressing situation and begged the Warrens to return her call. So even though it was like 12.40 in the morning, Lorraine immediately tried to call her back, and while the phone rang continuously, the connection was broken. Lorraine tried a few more times, going so far as to contact the phone operator and the operator's supervisor, who ran tests on the phone line and frustratingly didn't find anything weird. The next day, when the Warrens returned home from church, Lorraine immediately phoned the foster home again. This time, Mrs. Foster answered the phone on the second ring and mentioned that the phone had never rang the night before, and Lorraine made the decision to go pay the Fosters a visit that afternoon. She and Ed arrived at around 2 p.m. and met not only Mrs. Foster and her husband, but also their three offspring, Abby, Joel, and Hannah, who had experienced most of the phenomena. Ed arranged his recording gear on a nearby table while Lorraine asked her permission to walk the house, which she was immediately granted. Mrs. Foster brought up that her daughter Meg, the three offspring Abby, Joel, and Meg, who had experienced most of the phenomena. Ed arranged his recording gear on a nearby table while Lorraine asked her permission to walk the house, which she was immediately granted. Mrs. Foster brought up that her daughter Meg had always been interested in the occult and had purchased a book on conjuring as a gift for Meg, and based off of the description Ed gave of it, I believe it was a copy of the Ars Goetia. Now Meg admitted to attempting to summon a few of the spirits in the book, but had lost hope because nothing had happened. Ed prompted further, asking for specifics on the experiences that had happened in the last week when only the younglings were home. So let's set the scene. The boys were already in bed and Meg had just taken a shower. After going downstairs to make sure the doors were locked and you know the lights were off, Meg returned upstairs to the sounds of running water and the faucets had turned back on without any human's touch. Now downstairs, the lights and the radio had turned back on as well. Meg went downstairs and watched the radio dial moving on its own. After turning it off again, she got halfway up the stairs when she felt an icy cold hand touch her on the shoulder, just for a second in the dark. Now Meg bolted up the rest of the stairs, into her room, shut the door, turned off the lights, and hid under her covers. Outside the door, sounds of heavy footsteps caused her to suddenly shake under her covers. And then, more noises joined in with the mysterious steps. A door downstairs slammed shut, accompanied by furniture being pushed around and crashing, almost as if an angry person had broken into remodel. When Meg was able to open her eyes again, 
one, she saw a silver light come out of the woods and glide into her room. The next thing she knew, something, some hand, yanked her hair three times. Each time it pulled harder until the third time it made her eyes water. Now, she ran into her brother's room for safety, and he confirmed that he was also terrified by hearing the assorted unknown noises. Accompanied by loud whispering he could not make out. The duo eventually gathered enough courage to call their parents at the home they were at, but by the time the adults returned, all of the paranormal action had paused, and they were convinced the offspring were um, making it up. On the second occasion, everything that happened was almost the same as the first, but this time they involved the family dog, who was snarling at something that no one could see. Now, Joel remembered it as strange, because the dog was deaf and could barely hear noise. So when the wards were hiding in a bedroom on this occasion, instead of a silver figure, they saw a dark purplish cloud that they were unable to look at directly. So Lorraine at this point had returned and reported that she had experienced an inhuman presence throughout the home and asked Meg if she possessed, you know, black conjuring candles in her room. And when she responded yes, Ed told the family that he and Lorraine could handle everything, but um, they should maybe head out for a drive while it was happening. For safety. Ed and Lorraine got to work the moment the Fosters left, determined to discover the true nature of the spirit's presence in order to dispel it. For provocation purposes, Ed used a crucifix and holy water, scattering the water at all four points of the cellar floor, and saying aloud, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command all spirits, whether human or diabolical, to leave this dwelling and never return. On the first floor, Ed repeated the same procedure in each of the rooms. This process, known to any exorcist as binding, requires the infesting spirit to either show itself or move on. Having bound the cellar and all downstairs room without incident, the Warrens were ready to approach the second floor, where the new difficulty was lurking. But as they prepared to act, a telepathically projected feeling of dread came over them, which is a distinct indication of an inhuman demonic presence. They pressed on and began climbing the staircase to the second floor. But as hard as they tried, neither Ed nor Lorraine could get any more than halfway up. Pushing against them was some impenetrable, unyielding force. So slowly, the Warrens backed down the stairs so as not to be knocked over backwards. And at the bottom of the stairs, for a brief second, and diabolical laughter rang out. So, annoyed, Ed threw more holy water on the stairs, which caused the pressure to diminish enough to let them reach the top. They were able to bind almost all the rooms without incident, saving Meg's for last. Ed swung the door wide open, and he and Lorraine immediately felt the need to take a step back from the horrible sense of misery emanating from the room. With a steely composure, Ed walked into the room, cross in hand. Though no physical presence was there to be seen, the bedroom was freezing cold. One last time, Ed threw holy water in all four corners of the room, commanding, give us some sign of departure or an exorcism will be conducted here this very day. Almost instantly, the morbid sense of misery began to drain away, and the temperature in the room gradually returned to normal. So Meg's bedroom did contain those black conjuring candles, occult vestments, and books containing the rites for rituals of all sorts. Ed placed the items in the gal's trash basket, set them out in the hallway, and then sealed the room by reading a prescribed prayer of sanctification. He brought them back to his home for safekeeping, and uh, that's one copy of the Ars Goetia I have no need to read. Thank you! See? I've told y'all. Don't summon beings! In third place, we have a shadow doll. Among one of the first haunted items visible to those who visit the Warren Occult Museum is a shadow doll, which boasts bird feathers and a genuine human tooth, and she's just overall terrifying to look at. I'm calling it now, she better join that TV universe one day. For reference, a shadow doll is a statue or deity of sorts that is made specifically for harm to be used at the center of curses. I happen to know the steps for the most common curse, and while I'll leave out a step for safety, I promise I'll elaborate. Now, the caster would first need to take a picture of the doll, write a curse on the back of the photo, and uh, then send it to whoever the curse is aimed for. You know, hopefully you've got their mailing address. The person who receives the picture with the curse will sadly invite that curse into their lives. Oh, uh, almost forgot. The doll is also going to appear in that person's dreams, so enjoy your nightmares, folks. While not too much is known about the origins of this specific doll, it was initially purchased in a secondhand store under the assumption that it was simply, you know, an antique. I've got a couple of old dolls myself, and I'm shuddering to think about what they would do if activated by any kind of curse. Some of them talk enough already. In second place, we have Black Magic Mask, which is a concept in theosophy, mysticism, and the paranormal, of a materialized thought form, typically in human form such as an imaginary friend or being that is created through spiritual practice and intense concentration. In simpler English, the masks act as a representation of the practice, which is a form of mysticism that involves creating sentient and autonomous beings separate from oneself. The concept of tulpas and their creation, including the word tulpa, come from a closed Tibetan Buddhist practice, with tulpa being a Tibetan word for a creature of the mind. Tulpas did not become part of Western paranormal normal lore until around the 1970s, and those who practice have been cited as wearing masks similar to Halloween ones in order to take on the appearance of whatever the mask looks like. If anyone is curious about modern practices and appropriations of Tulpamancers, the interweb origins can be traced back to 4chan message boards in 2009, and I'm not going to elaborate on just how awful that sentence was to utter. 
Oh, it gets worse. The communities gained popularity when adult fans of My Little Pony started discussing tulpas of characters from the Friendship is Magic television series. The fans attempted to use meditation and lucid dreaming techniques to create imaginary friends. Well, I think that about sums that up, don't you? In first place, we have the Black Lace Veil. So after one of their many public lectures, Ed was conversing with a couple that had been in the audience, where the boy introduced himself as Alan and explained that he'd brought his girlfriend Lonnie to the lecture because he suspected that she'd been overtaken by some occult influence. He explained that when his girlfriend became angry, her features would change into something resembling a wolf, and then the voice of a different person would speak from inside her. When Lorraine walked over to join the group, Lonnie experienced an episode of instantaneous possession and lurched out in an attempt to attack Lorraine. This incident terrified everyone in the vicinity, with the Warrens ending the audience chat session immediately, before Ed escorted the couple to an offstage room while Lorraine stayed outside. In the backstage room, the girl was fully under possession, breathing heavily, and her facial features had transformed into the wolf-like appearance the boy had talked about. After about 10 minutes, the possession passed, and Lonnie was lucid enough to explain, you know, dealing with memory loss, along with losing hours and days of her life over the last three months, which is a symptom common in possession. She went on to share that originally her now boyfriend, Alan, had refused all of her advances and bribery attempts at becoming hers, and she had resorted to visiting a store prominent and selling tools to help with witchcraft, purchasing there a book on the black arts, and later that night performing a ritual for acquiring lovers. This ritual involved, you guessed it, the black lace veil, on top of which she placed a crown of goat horns before renouncing God and her baptism, along with swearing allegiance to Satan, finishing the ritual by washing down the vow with a cup of animal scarlet elixir. About a month after Lonnie performed the ritual, Alan began paying her the attention she craved, making her entitled world perfect. What she hadn't counted on, however, was that she was now in debt to the demonic, having given them permission to enter her life. Ed knew immediately that Lonnie would have to undergo an exorcism as soon as possible, and made contact with the priest the next morning, who was able to come assist with the procedure. Upon arrival, the priest insisted on testing the spirit, so he instructed Lonnie to close her eyes and slowly count to 20, while his assistant stood behind her and placed a cross around 6 inches behind her head. The entity possessing the girl suddenly went wild, screaming, take it away, it burns. Take it away. During the exorcism, it kept screaming, she's mine, she's mine, her soul is mine, in reference to Lonnie. It was eventually separated from Lonnie, but just before it departed, the thing vowed it would return to another. The Warrens brought the black lace veil, goat horns, cup, and the conjuring book home with them so she would be safe from possession, but the tale of the veil doesn't end here. Months later, when Ed was in a meeting with a lady who was manifesting different personalities, you know, some male, some female, and some that couldn't even be called human, but all making extremely threatening statements, her eyes began to wander, and when they landed on the black veil, she jumped up, grabbed the veil, and clutched it to her chest. Her features immediately began to transform into those of a wild wild, sneering creature, distinct from the otherwise attractive girl. Ed drew two vials of water to himself, one unblessed, the other blessed by an exorcist, and moved away from what was no longer this woman, but an inhuman spirit, a lesser devil of hell. Horn moaning and various animal sounds came from the girl as Ed blessed her, banishing the demon away for now a second and final time. And that brings us to the end of our list, and I'm glad all of those items are still kicking around the Warren Museum for safety and uh, not out in the open. Number 5. The Anguished Man The tale of this rather disturbing looking painting is strange strange and steeped in mystery, but every scant piece of information we have on it is more unsettling than the last. The painting of a featureless man who seems to be screaming was apparently painted by a deeply troubled artist who mixed his own blood with his paints in an effort to get the right shade of red. Not long after completing it, the artist took his own life, and the painting found its way into a woman's care. She kept it for many years, but claimed that once she put the painting up, her and her family began to see a dark, shadowy figure roaming about their house. At night, they would hear strange sounds like footsteps and crying. The woman took the painting down and kept it locked in her attic for 25 years until she died, leaving the painting to its current caretaker. Sean Robinson. Sean had been warned by his grandmother that the painting was haunted, but he thought little of it. Robinson kept the painting in his basement for about a decade, before rediscovering it and putting it up. Once again, the family began seeing the dark, shadowy figure roaming the halls and hearing the sound of weeping and moaning during the night. Sean began leaving a camera on by the painting to try and get evidence of its paranormal nature, and upon reviewing the footage, heard some odd noises and saw evidence of doors 
doors opening and closing seemingly by themselves, and the painting falling over onto the ground. As time went on, the activity became more and more intense, with his wife seeing a strange mist and an unseen force pushing his son down the stairs. Things went from bad to worse when guests who came to see the painting began reporting intense and sudden nosebleeds. Sean takes the painting out from time to time to show it to paranormal investigators and television programs who want to hear his story, but otherwise, the anguished man is apparently kept locked away in a safe location to prevent any further harm from coming to unwitting people. Number 4. Robert the Evil Doll We've all heard of the cursed Annabelle doll that has permeated pop culture for the last decade, but have you heard of Robert? Robert was a gift to a young boy of the same name, Robert Eugene Otto, from his grandfather. The grandfather had been traveling in Germany and came across the doll who was not intended to be a toy, but a window display. He bought the doll for his grandson, who dressed it in a sailor's outfit that he had outgrown and kept it with him at almost all times. As the young boy grew up, witnesses remember his relationship with the doll seemed to grow more and more unhealthy, with him referring to the doll as a living person and blaming mishaps on him. The boy, who went by his middle name, Gene, grew up to be an eccentric artist in a stately home known as the Artist's House. He kept Robert by the upstairs window, where children claimed to see him moving in and out of view. When Jean died in 1974, the new owner of the house, Myrtle Reuter, found the doll and became its new owner. Visitors of the house began reporting the sound of giggling and footsteps coming from the attic where the doll was being kept. When the doll was around people who spoke ill of its original owner, some claim that his facial expression seemed to change. After Myrtle got sick of the doll apparently moving around the home by itself and scaring guests for 20 years, she chose to donate Robert to the Fort East Martello Museum in Key West, Florida. Robert now resides in a locked display case to prevent the over 120 year old doll from decaying further, but also to protect the visitors of the museum. But even those precautions don't seem to always work. Guests who insult Robert at the museum report experiencing tragedies in their lives not long after. This has ranged from people losing their jobs, getting divorced, breaking bones, getting into automobile accidents, and even a few deaths. The doll reportedly receives letters every day from admirers, people wanting the doll to curse their enemies, and a few from people asking Robert to reverse the curse they believe he has laid upon them. Number 3. The Women from Lem Statue This limestone statue, also known as the Goddess of Death, was discovered in Lem, Cyprus in 1878. Its purpose, or exactly what it was meant to portray, has been lost to time, but many experts believe it may be a fertility statue of an unknown goddess. Whatever the reason for the carving, experts have concluded that it was carved sometime around 3500 BC. After being found in 1878, it was purchased by a man named Lord Elfont. Within six years of having acquired the object, Elfont and all six of his family members had died under mysterious circumstances. The statue passed to a man named Ivor Manucci, who died along with his entire family within four years of the purchase. The same thing happened to its next owner, Lord Thompson Noel, and his family. The statue seemed to disappear for a time before being acquired by Sir Alan Biverbrook, who had a wife, two daughters, and two sons. Yet again, family members began to drop like flies, with Biverbrook, his daughters, and his wife all passing within a few years. Fearing that they would be next, Biverbrook's sons decided to donate the statue to the Royal Museum in Edinburgh, Scotland, where it was soon put on display. However, the statue was not quite done and the curator who had handled the statue mysteriously died the next year. The statue is still on display to this day, locked in a heavy glass display case. Number 2. Thomas Busby's Chair Our next entry takes us to North Yorkshire in 1702, when two criminals, Daniel Audy and his son-in-law, Thomas Busby, came into conflict. They were coin forgers who essentially ran a criminal empire, but Daniel disapproved of Tom's relationship with his daughter. This resulted in a fight which ended with Daniel's untimely demise. Thomas was arrested soon afterwards and sentenced to be there is some variation in what happened next. Some versions of the tale say that Thomas was arrested at his favorite pub, and others say he was allowed back into the bar for his last drink before his death. Whatever the case, before being taken away, he told the other patrons of the pub, May sudden death come to anyone who dare sit in my chair. He was then taken away and 
As the local historian and poet William Grange described it, the bones of the poor wretch who had committed murder to fester in the sunshine and blow in the tempest until they fell piecemeal to earth, and tradition yet tells tales of night wanderers being terrified when passing the dreaded spot. While Thomas began apparently haunting the spot across from the inn where his remains were displayed, the curse he laid on the chair began taking effect. Over the years, many brave souls sat on the chair to prove they were not afraid and paid the price. In 1894, a chimney sweep sat in the chair and was found the next day hanging next to where where Busby had been displayed. In 1967, two Air Force pilots sat in the chair as a joke, but when they were driving home that night, they crashed into a tree and did not survive. A few years later, a builder sat in the chair and fell off a roof later that same night. Not long after, a cleaner fell into the chair after slipping while mopping the floor and died of a brain tumor soon after. In 1978, the owner of the now renamed Busby Stoop Inn decided that too many deaths had occurred and donated the chair to the Thirst community. Museum. Although they didn't technically lock the chair away, they did hang the chair on the wall, five feet off the ground, to prevent anyone from sitting on it and receiving Busby's fatal curse. Number 1. The Bassano Vase Although it has fallen out of favor now, for centuries a common gift given to brides on the day of their weddings were intricate ornate vases. Our next tale begins in the 15th century Italy and spans over 500 years. Legend says that on the day of her wedding, a bride in a village near Napoli found a gift with no clue which of the guests had given it to her. It was a four pound silver vase. She decided to put it in her room for safekeeping before the wedding ceremony. But when the ceremony was due to start, the bride was nowhere to be found. The groom went to her room to look for her and found her lifeless body on the ground with no trace of what had caused the death other than her desperately clutching the silver vase. The bride was buried and the vase was passed on to one of her family members to be taken care of. Within days, the second member of the family was dead from unknown causes. The vase was given to another member of the family, and when he also passed away, the family made the connection between all the recent tragedies and the Bassano vase. Unsure what to do, they reached out to a local priest who upon hearing the story informed them that whoever had given it to the bride had either cursed it or made it from cursed materials. He advised them to bury it on sacred grounds. They dug a hole and wrote a note warning, beware. This vase brings death, which they placed inside the cursed vase. The vase was buried and remained underground for the next 500 years. By horrible chance, a man in 1988 was digging and came across the vase. He read the note, but being the skeptical type, discarded it and took the newly found Bassano vase to a local auction house. The vase went up for auction and was sold for the equivalent of $2,270 to the local pharmacist. Within three months, the pharmacist was dead and the vase was sold by his family to a a local doctor, who also passed away soon after. The vase developed a reputation after this, and several people who were approached to purchase it refused, but it was eventually bought by an archaeologist who, despite his family's protests, did not believe in curses. He died three months later. His family threw the vase out their window, but a police officer who was passing by saw this and tried to return it. The family refused the vase back and told him of its cursed nature. He tried to give it to multiple different museums, but having heard about the curse, they all refused. Fearing for his life, he did what the bride's family had done over 500 years prior and buried it in a lead box in a cemetery. Which cemetery he used is unknown, but let us hope that no unwitting soul rediscovers this cursed vase and unleashes it upon humanity once again. Number 5. The Family Jewels Some things get passed on generation to generation, some are begged, some are borrowed, and some are stolen. Our first cursed item has made its way across the many seas at the price of many lives. At a whopping 186 carats, the Koh-i-Noor diamond may look precious beyond all belief, but this cursed gemstone has a much darker, unbelievable side too. The name derives from the Persian Hindi words Mountain of Light. Many theories exist as to its original owner and who was originally cut for. A Hindu description of the diamond warns that, quote, he who owns this diamond will own the world, but will also know all of its misfortunes. Only God or women can wear it with impunity. Well, that's jarring, to say the least. Right there in writing, huh? Yeah. It passed between the hands of various rulers, blood-soaked era after another, 
a king who blinded his own son and a ruler whose head had become encrusted with liquid molten gold was paid for this price. Legend has it that the stone's origins of causing death and misfortune to any male who owns or wears it stems from brothers murdering each other to even sons murdering their fathers over it. But does it actually carry a curse affecting men who wear it? First owned by the emperors of the Mughal Empire in India, it was taken and added with the Timur ruby to make an armband for ruler of the Peacock Empire. The diamond then went to Sikh Maharaja Ranjit Singh. After his death, his five-year-old son Dulip Singh, the last Maharaja of the Sikh Empire, would be the last male who ever seemed to wear it. Since being owned by the British royal family, and oddly enough, it's only ever been worn by females. Huh. After Queen Victoria's death, Queen Alexandra got it and was used to crown her at her coronation in 1902. The diamond was then transferred to Queen Mary's crown in 1911 and finally to the Queen Mother's crown in 1937, where it remained for more than 80 years. When Queen Elizabeth died in 2002, the crown was placed on top of her casket for the funeral. All of the crowns are now on display in the Jewel House at the Tower of London, with crystal replicas of the diamonds set in the older models they were in. So what's the deal? Is this thing still cursed? Did the royal family know something that we didn't? Maybe. Number four, the statues of Lem. The women of Lem statue was discovered in Lem, Cyprus in 1878 and dates back to about 3500 BCE. The statue eventually earned the nickname the Goddess of Death after four different families experienced tragedy while handling and owning the carved stones. The first owner, Lord Elfont, along with his entire family, perished within six years of owning the statue, all from mysterious and rapid illnesses. The other two owners, Ivor Minucci and Lord Thompson Noel, also died along with their entire family's just a few short years after obtaining the statue within their homes. The fourth owner, Sir Alan Biverbrook, died alongside his wife and two daughters of mysterious causes while in possession of the carved rock. Although his sons did not believe in the curse attached to the statue, out of fear of the sudden misfortunes around them, they decided to gift the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh the find, where it is now encased in glass, safe, unable to bear any other family bad news. You gotta think, someone was just like sitting there back then chiseling this rock like 6,000 years ago. What were they thinking? What were they saying out loud? What were they looking at? Why did they seem to have blessed this rock with so much evil and misfortune? You tell me. Number three, the mummy. Not actually a mummy, but the mummy board or coffin or lid. The board is painted of an unknown high status woman from the 21st or 22nd dynasty. Time scale for you, that's about a thousand years BCE. The British Museum's unlucky mummy has earned quite the reputation for causing destruction through its ancient curse. The mummy was found at Thebes in Greece in the late 1800s, and tales of its curse started soon after its discovery. It's said that of the four young Englishmen who bought it, two died in a shooting accident and two died of health problems. A string of illnesses, accidents, and deaths following this are said to be attributed to the lid. One of the most infamous rumors about the mummy's curse is that it caused the sinking of the Titanic. Wait a minute, what? One of the victims on board was a journalist who apparently was the first to publish articles about the mummy's find and the curse that went with it. Survivors from the disaster recall hearing stories about the ship of an ominous artifact that has a sinister reputation. As the mummy's stories and the rumors spread, people who survived began to ask the question if the rumors had caused the disaster that night. The unlucky mummy is now an ancient Egyptian artifact in the collection of the British Museum in London. The identity of the original owner is still being studied and the related causes brought on by it. Due to the brief hieroglyphic inscriptions of short religious phrases, scientists are still trying to decide for the name and the curse that comes along with it, and the actual location of where the body disappeared to. It's been feared since the discovery in the late 1880s, and the mummy's lid has acquired a reputation credited with causing death, injury, and large-scale disasters, earning the nickname the unlucky mummy. None of these stories have any basis in fact, of course, but the mummy serves as a spiritual question mark and remains a mystery to scientists who crack the code open. Yo, where's Brendan Fraser when you need him, right? He can figure this whole thing out. Number two, the haunted bed. Apparently there's a bed that makes you more dizzy and have more sinister evil visions than that of a night on a waterbed. Yeah, I've had a couple hungover nights lost at sea, let me tell ya. Gets pretty choppy out there. Highly don't recommend it. But this bed, I also highly don't recommend. The lavishly ornate Great Bed of Wear does not like you sleeping in it. The hardwood oak bed is richly decorated and carved with figures and scenes you could daydream for, well, days over. It's so large that it's rumored to comfortably sleep four couples. Yeah talk about a California king. There is a tale that suggests that the bed was made in the 15th century for King Edward IV by a very gifted carpenter, but through the years found itself being passed between the inns of wear where commoners were able to sleep in it, break the legs, and apparently cover it head to toe in graffiti. Yeah, 
The disrespect alone. The defacing got so bad that apparently the ghost of the maker haunts those who are not of royal blood. Basically not blessed by God to rule. It's so old and so haunted that apparently people who spend the night are woken up violently by specters watching them sleep. Apparently there are so many initials carved into the wood, images drawn on it, that it's hard to know who actually the bed was originally fitted for, and who actually cursed it. Some researchers believe that the curse surrounding the bed could have actually been carved into it with symbols and text that hexed the next user. Whatever its history, it's haunted haunted. The bed can now be found in the British galleries of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. We need like the Long Island medium to take a nap in it, you know what I mean? See what she thinks. And coming in at the number one spot, the Terracotta Army. The Terracotta Army was discovered in 1974 by a group of farmers. Yang Zifa, his five brothers and neighbor were digging a well east of the Quin Emperor's tomb mound at Mount Lee. For centuries, occasional reports mentioned pieces of terracotta figures and fragments of the Quin necropolis. Roofing tiles, bricks, and masonry were regularly found. But when they discovered heads, Chinese archeologists started to investigate. To this day, it remains the largest pottery figure group ever found. The Terracotta Army seemed to be a collection of terracotta sculptures depicting the armies of Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. It is a form of funerary art buried with the emperor around 209 BCE with the purpose of protecting the emperor in the afterlife. The figures were discovered in Lingtong County outside Shaanxi, China. The figures vary in height according to their rules and they're all dressed in different garbs, the tallest of course being the generals. These statues include warriors, chariots equipped with horses, more than 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots, 520 horses, and 150 cavalry. Other terracotta non-military figures were found in pits close by, including officials, acrobats, strongmen, and musicians. Yo, are we sure that Medusa didn't just like make her way through China and start stoning people in time with her looks? Because that's like an entire city made out of clay. In the records of the Grand Historian, China's 24 dynastic histories, it was written that work on the mausoleum began in 246 BCE, soon after Emperor Quinn ascended the throne. Apparently the project involved 700,000 workers. Yeah, I'd really hope so, because that many perfectly sculpted figures are so realistic, there must have been a city of artists. The site is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site and has been since 1987. This is scary just looking at it. I'm not convinced this was just an art project for the journey between spirit realms. I think this was used as a decoy for battle. 20,000 figurines just chilling, waiting? Seems pretty intimidating to me. Whatever its origins, it's jarring to look at. What do you think? Number five on this list is the Bassano vase. The Bassano vase is one of those old family heirlooms that you really don't want to get passed down to you. It started out as a wedding gift, also something that you really don't want to receive on your wedding day. Anyways, it's a pretty vase, so the couple accepted this vase and then tragedy struck. On the night of the wedding, after the ceremony, the bride was found dead in her room. It's said that she had her hands wrapped around this vase as she was dying and in her final breaths before passing, vowed to have her revenge. This little vow at the end muddles things because we're not sure whether it was the vow that cursed the vase or if the vase was already cursed, but whatever. Adding it to the story makes it a little bit more interesting, so she cursed the vase. Either way, at this point, nobody realized that the vase had anything to do with the death of the young bride, which is really too bad. The vase turned into a family heirloom and was passed from generation to generation. As you can imagine, it didn't go so great for those who received this. More people kept dying, all of them extremely mysteriously. Eventually, somebody caught on and decided that this vase needed to get locked up for good. For a time, it was locked up in a secret location and nobody knew where this vase was. It should have stayed that way though. The vase in 1988 saw the light of day again and was sold off to a wealthy bidder who basically just bought an extremely expensive way to die. He died very soon after receiving this vase and thus it began all over again. The vase exchanged hands some more, killing off more and more people as it went. Finally, somebody with some proactive thinking gave it to the police. Now, nobody knows where it ended up. Whether the police destroyed it, hit it, or held onto it is anyone's guess. Number four on this list is the Chained Oak. This one is really interesting, and even though history hasn't necessarily hidden it from us, it's definitely tried to negate the consequences. Atlas Obscura says, The Chained Oak is an old tree wrapped in chains to prevent its branches from falling. 
This is due to an alleged curse put on the tree when, in 1821, the 15th Earl of Shrewsbury refused a woman's pleas for money. It's said that she then put a curse upon the nearby oak. For every branch that falls from the tree, a member of the Earl's family would die. Later that night, one of the Earl's relatives died suddenly under mysterious circumstances. Convinced that the curse was true, the Earl ordered that the branches of the oak should be chained up to prevent more from falling. I feel for that Earl's family, man. Like, literally, I'm just a grandkid of this dude, and now if this tree breaks a little bit, I'm gonna die? No thank you. At least the Earl had the sense to chain up the tree and make sure that it won't happen to harm his family. But one big storm rolls through that place and wham, now some random person is just dying. Just pray that you don't happen to be the descendant of this guy, and if you are, cross your fingers, those chains were done up tight. Number three on this list is the baker's wedding dress. Marriage is supposed to be one of the happiest times of your life. Finding that partner you intend to spend the rest of your life with, and then actually doing just that. Therefore, one of the happiest days of your life should be the day that all of this becomes official your wedding day. That's why it's particularly sad when tragedy or drama occurs on the day of said wedding. Just that is exactly what happened with Anna Baker. Scoop Whoop says, Inside the Baker Mansion in Altoona, USA is the wedding dress of Anna Baker, who fell in love with an iron worker. Legends claim that Anna eloped from her home to get married to her lover, but her father forcibly brought her back and locked her in her bedroom. She then refused to marry anyone else and spent the rest of her life alone. After her death, the members of the Baker family reported spotting Anna's wedding dress at different places around the house. Some of them even saw the spirit of Anna Baker moving around the house dressed in that same wedding dress. Imagine literally getting forced back home and locked in your room by your father as you're getting married. It's no wonder that Anna was pissed and why this specific object has become very cursed. Now it's locked up in a case and hidden from the world in the Baker Mansion. It's a good thing that it is because what Scoop Whoop didn't talk about is the fact that this dress can actually be dangerous. As ridiculous as it actually sounds, it has reportedly tried to strangle people in their sleep before. I know that the image of a floating wedding dress trying to suffocate somebody is kind of humorous, but I promise you that you wouldn't be laughing if it happened to you. I like that this thing is locked up, but would be far more comfortable if we just threw it in the fire and were done with it completely. Number two on this list is the Anguished Man Painting. The Anguished Man Painting is pretty much exactly what it sounds like, a painting of a man in some very clear anguish. The thing is that this man doesn't really look all that human. He hardly has any facial features at all and almost looks a bit like a burn victim. Also, where his eyeballs should be, there's just these two gaping holes and his mouth also looks like one giant hole with no end. Even without the haunting associated with this picture, it's already pretty scary and I personally have no idea why anyone would want it in their home. That's exactly what Sean Robinson did though and he quickly suffered the consequences. Scoop Whoop says, Fascinated by the charm of the Anguished Man painting, Sean Robinson inherited the painting from his grandmother and decided to hang the painting on the wall of his house. Soon after that, Sean and his family started experiencing paranormal events like cracking of the doors in the middle of the night and sudden blood-curdling screams from nowhere. Sean's wife decided to investigate the origin of the painting and found that the artist who painted the painting killed himself and before doing that, he mixed his own blood with the paint that he used in making the painting. Learning this, the couple decided to hide the painting in the basement of their house in Cumbria. So, the first thing about this story that is kind of questionable is how anybody could be fascinated by the charm of this thing. It's gross, and I don't like looking at it, let alone having it hanging in my home. The second thing that's super questionable is why we decided to hide it. I swear, none of these people have ever heard of fire before, guys. Like, great, thank you for hiding it from the world. This is helpful, but what would be even more helpful is if we just took a match and burned it so nobody ever has to deal with it again. I apologize to the artist who painted this thing, but if you're gonna use your own blood and make a haunted painting, then come on, man, kinda deserves to be burned. And finally, number one on this list is the Thomas Busby Chair. 
This chair is freaking deadly, man, and even though it's pretty much safe from public use now, I still hate that it exists. Scoop Whoop says, popularly known as Busby's stoop chair, this wooden furniture is cursed by the spirit of Thomas Busby, who was known to ruthlessly murder people. Before getting hanged for his crimes, he requested to have a meal in his favorite local pub. Upon finishing his meal, he stood and said, may sudden death come to anyone who dares sit on my chair. And ever since then, 63 people who dared to sit on the chair met untimely and terrifying deaths. Later, the owner of the pub donated the chair to the Thirsk Museum UK, and it's still there, hung one and a half meters off the ground to prevent any further deaths. Can you imagine owning that pub and being like, oh, no worries, 60 people have died in this chair, all is good. Like, how the heck did we allow 63 separate people to sit in this chair and die? And okay, like, I'm happy that it's hanging one and a half meters off the ground and nobody can sit in it, but guys, come on. This is literally a dangerous weapon that we have right here. The fact that this thing hasn't been totally dismantled is kind of ridiculous. What happens if somebody steals this chair and then decides, you know what, I'm gonna murder people with it without anybody finding out? Frankly, I think history should have hidden this thing a little bit better. Hopefully we don't hear any more murderous stories about it from here on out. Number four on this list is the Screaming Skull. Last I checked, if there is no meat on the bone, then a skull shouldn't be screaming. That's kind of what's going down with this one extremely haunted skull in Burton Agnes Hall, England. Instablog says, what if you touch an object and then you hear terrible, deafening screams? That is precisely what happens when you touch this skull at an Elizabethan manor in England. Burton Agnes Hall is the house of Catherine Ann Griffith, who was brutally murdered by numerous bullies in 1620. Her skull still rests inside the house. Why? Because whenever somebody tried to take it out of the house, what happened next terrified them to the bone. People who have tried to touch or disturb that skull have reported seeing a scary ghost walk in and utter a deafening scream. This scared the people so much that they actually ran out of the house in terror. If you're up for a scary challenge, then this might be your chance to prove your mettle to the world, but for the weak-hearted ones, it's wise to stay away. And yeah, guys, I mean, I agree with that article right there. Probably best not to mess with this thing. I mean, a bunch of paranormal investigators won't even go here anymore. If a bunch of paranormal investigators think that this area is too scary for them, then sorry guys, I'm tapping out. It's way too scary for me too. Number three on this list is the Maori warrior masks. Now these warrior masks hold a curse that won't affect everyone, just a small portion of people. Specifically, women who are soon to be expecting children. The Occult Museum says, New Zealand's Maori warriors are part of an ancient tribe who would carve unique masks when it was time for battle. When a man died in the mask, it was believed that his soul would remain trapped in the mask they were wearing. Although their mythology does not dictate that any harm is done by the trapped souls, the presence of the masks has a strange and sometimes fatal effect on pregnant women. Women who are expecting often experience complications when they come in contact with the masks. It's unknown why this phenomenon occurs, but the museum that holds the remaining masks posts a warning that pregnant women should stay away. The literal museum is out here warning pregnant women not to come. That's how you know that this thing's seriously dangerous. Like whenever a business or enterprise does something that's actually gonna lose them money, that's when you have my attention. Considering they just lost an entire demographic of people, I'm now listening and buying into this curse. The paranormal investigators who aren't pregnant have taken a look at this and they're having a hard time getting to the bottom of it. Some people have suggested that the Maori tribe thought that pregnant women were taboo, but that also doesn't really make any sense because then how would they have repopulated their tribe? Regardless of why it is the way that it is, just know that if you are expecting, that's not the right time to take a look at these masks. Number two on this list is the Surrey Ghost Car. So this is a weird one and 
definitely something that paranormal investigators are a bit spooked by. List 25 says crashes are common on the A3 highway in England, so it looked like a routine matter when police in Surrey received calls that a car had meh, veered off the A3 with its headlights blazing. But when officers went to investigate, they found no signs of the reported vehicle. However, a further search revealed chilling results. Just 60 feet from the reported crash scene and buried in twisted undergrowth was the remains of a wrecked car containing a decomposing body of a young man who, as the police estimated, had crashed there five months earlier. Therefore, what the witnesses reported might have been a ghostly apparition of the original car. Now, how on earth does that make any sense at all? You know what, let me answer that for you. It doesn't. First off, how did no one notice this car earlier? And then, what was that ghostly apparition that had a car veer off the road? Paranormal investigators are all scared of this one because who knows what type of effect this ghost car could have on your vehicle. And finally, number one on this list is the cursed mirror. This mirror isn't just cursed with a bad reflection, it's gonna show you something a lot worse than just you with a little bed head or something. Instablog says, if you've seen Oculus, then chances are already you're scared of mirrors. And let's not even go back to the time when Bloody Mary was a whole thing. But if these creepy images of mirrors in the horror genre weren't enough, here's a real object which is most likely cursed. In St. Francisville, Louisiana, there's a plantation house which is one of the most haunted houses in America. Inside the house is this mirror, a cursed mirror. Legend goes that the plantation slave brutally killed the owner of the house named Sarah Woodruff and her daughters inside the house. Ever since then, they remain trapped inside the mirror. Visitors often report sights of handprints on the mirror along with some unexplainable strange marks. And the classic haunting is also rumored figures dressed in white, old-fashioned attire visible on the other side of the mirror. Some people who have been exposed to this mirror for longer than they should say that these figures in white follow them around too. That they've even seen them appear in other mirrors outside of the plantation and one or two of them have talked about how they've seen them outside of a mirror entirely as if they were standing like right in front of them. It seems like the longer that you're exposed to this, the more of an impact the curse will have on you. Kind of like, I don't know, radiation poisoning or something like that, where the time you spend among the toxin, that's gonna hurt you more. Obviously, because of this, paranormal investigators don't wanna spend too long investigating this mirror. A short stint doing some research probably won't hurt you, although it will definitely give you a scare considering you're gonna see the figures on the other side. But extended exposure is where the real danger lies with this cursed item. Number five on this list is the Die Book Box. This is an evil box that tormented many people and even claimed some lives along the way. Zach Baggins writes, According to Jewish folklore, a diabok is a dark spirit that takes over the bodies of living people and uses them for evil. Legend has it that a diabok can be trapped inside of a box and prevented from causing mischief unless the box is opened, that is. Several years ago, the diabok box came up for sale on eBay. The seller listed a vintage wine cabinet that came from the estate of a woman who survived a world War II concentration camp. The seller, an antique dealer named Kevin Manis, claimed that the first owner's granddaughter was terrified of the box, warning him that her grandmother said it held a diabook. After buying the cabinet, he was plagued by a series of unfortunate events and recurring nightmares of an old hag that would brutally attack him, causing him to wake up with bruises on his body. He also experienced an overpowering stench of cat urine in his home. Tragically, his mother suffered a stroke while opening the box. Not surprisingly, he decided to get rid of it. The box eventually ended up in the hands of Missouri Medical Museum director Jason Haxton, who was skeptical about the powers attributed to the box. He soon changed his mind. After acquiring the box, he began to experience a series of medical maladies, including bleeding eyes and strange rashes. He also began to dream of being attacked by an old hag and would also awake with bruises on his body. Kevin Manis told me that while the 
box was at Haxton's basement, a man died there and his body was found lying next to the box. He eventually became so unnerved by the box that he reached out to scientists and rabbis who instructed him to build a wooden ark lined with 24 karat gold, place the box inside, and bury it in the ground. Now this actually wasn't the end of the story for this box. The box was eventually dug up again and then later donated to a museum. This was after it had tormented a few more people mind you though. Now it's fully encased in a glass covering but even that doesn't stop the evil spirit from coming after people. Many people who have visited this box have reported having serious episodes in the room while they're looking at it. Whatever spirit is trapped inside this box, it is clearly an extremely powerful one. The box remains on display at the museum but I wouldn't recommend going to check it out if I was you. Number 4 on this list is the Devil's Rocking Chair. The Devil's Rocking Chair is actually from one of Ed and Lorraine Warren's most famous case, The Devil Made Me Do It. Zach Baggins writes, The horror began in July 1980 when David Glatzel, 11 years old, became possessed by a demon. One night he woke up screaming, claiming that he had been visited by a man with big black eyes, a thin face with animal features, jagged teeth, pointed ears, horns, and hooves. David was, everyone agreed, not the kind of kid who liked scary movies or who was likely to make things up and he was visibly shaken up by this experience. He became rather withdrawn and quiet. His older sister, Debbie, asked her fiance, Aaron Johnson, if he would stay with her family for a while and see whether it would help David get out of his depression. Aaron, of course, agreed, but things didn't get better. David reported having more nightmares about the terrifying man who promised to take his soul. Odd scratches and bruises began to appear on the boy and all the injuries seemed to happen while he was asleep. Odd sounds, which Arn couldn't explain, were heard in the attic. Worst of all, David began to claim that he was now seeing the beast while he was awake. He was always seen sitting in the family's rocking chair, which the beast now claimed as his own. David was the only one who saw the beast in the chair, but family members often saw it rocking back and forth, seemingly under its own power. This was obviously a lot, so the Warrens were brought in to perform the exorcism. The exorcism took place in that rocking chair, and it's thought that the chair itself still has some evil energy from this spirit attached to it. Now the chair resides at the haunted museum, but owner Zach Beggins actually took the exhibit down because the chair was simply too dangerous, he thought. Number three on this list is the Hope Diamond. Don't get me wrong, guys. I would love to have this thing, but I just don't know if the juice is worth the squeeze here. Google Arts and Culture says, one of the most famous diamonds in the world, the Hope Diamond, originated in the Kular mine in Andhra Pradesh, India. According to the legend the stone is cursed and brings misfortune to anyone who owns it. The curse is said to have come about when the original diamond was stolen from the eye of a statue. The thief met a grisly end, kickstarting a pattern of misfortune for all those who possessed the diamond. Over the years, owners of the Hope Diamond have befallen fates including death by murder, execution, they've taken their own lives, bankruptcy, and imprisonment. Thankfully, the curse seems to have been lifted when the diamond was donated to the Smithsonian in 1958. Now, I don't really buy into the fact that this curse is lifted, in my opinion. Like, literally, if you own this diamond, then you die or someone you love dies. That's what's happened throughout history. In the best possible case scenario, you just get hit with, like, horrible luck and lose all your money or some other horrible thing. There just really isn't any good way to spin this. Owning the Hope Diamond is pretty much a horrible idea. Number two on this list is the Unlucky Mummy. Do not get on a boat if said boat is also carrying this mummy. Google Arts and Culture says, the unlucky mummy isn't actually a mummy, but the mummy board or coffin lid of a high status woman who lived in around 950 to 900 BCE. Discovered in Thebes in the 1800s, the four young Englishmen who first purchased the mummy all died in unfortunate circumstances. Rumors of the curse soon spread, and in the early 20th century, journalist William Thomas Steed wrote an article on the jinxed artifact. Steed went on to be one of the passengers on the doomed Titanic. It's said that he told stories of the curse in the run-up to the disaster, with many believing that the mummy itself caused the ship's watery end. Today, the unlucky mummy is on display in the British Museum. The Titanic was supposed to be unsinkable. Enter in the unlucky mummy, and boom, now the unsinkable ship goes down. Maybe it's a stretch to say that this thing caused the literal Titanic crash, but I can at least guarantee that it 
probably didn't help. At least this thing is now locked up in a museum very much on land and not connected to any boats that I know of. And number one on this list is the hands resist him painting. I'm all about having some cool groundbreaking art, but this painting definitely crosses the line. The lineup says there is no doubt the painting is disturbing. It shows a young boy standing next to a girl doll with hollow eyes and a sad downturned mouth. The doll is holding a strange device with wires coming out of it. The eeriest part of the painting are the many disembodied children's hands reaching toward the boy through the glass panels of a door just behind him. But even more disturbing than the painting itself are the stories of what has happened to people who come in contact with it. A few years after the painting was sold, the art critic Henry Seldes died. Then the gallery owner died. Then in 1984, John Marley died. The painting disappeared, not surfacing again until 2000 in a bizarre posting on eBay. The new owners were trying to sell it because they said, it was haunted. They claimed the boy and the doll in the picture would fight with each other during the night, terrifying their four-year-old daughter. They set up a motion sensing camera in the room for three nights and claimed they had captured the boy in the picture, leaving the frame and coming into the room, apparently fleeing in terror. The literal kid in the painting is leaving. Not freaking cool, guys. My paintings are supposed to be static and not moving, and they definitely aren't supposed to be walking around my home scaring the living bejesus out of me my family. Apparently this painting is locked up in a storage locker now and no one is allowed to see it. Number five, the Great Bed of Ware. Located in the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Great Bed of Ware has become infamous for its dark, twisted history. Constructed in 1850, the bed was created as a tourist attraction for an inn in Ware. The four-poster bed is over three meters wide and is the only known example of a bed this size. It's been said that it is able to accommodate at least four couples, minimum. Eight people, wow. <laughs> Guests would carve their initials into the Wood, or apply red wax seals to commemorate their stay and leave their mark on the bed. The marks are still visible on the bed to this day. The bed's carving is typical for the late Elizabethan period with ornamental ribbon-like patterns, lions and satyrs to symbolize fertility and virility. By 1931, the bed became the single most expensive item of furniture, specifically a single piece of furniture opposed to a set. According to legend, the carpenter who made the bed was so enraged by the disrespectful treatment of his work that his ghost attacked any commoner who slept in it. And you know, the carpenter made the bed for a king and then traveling commoners slept in it and carved their names all over. I'd be kind of upset too. Like, he must have believed the bed was going to be treated a lot differently than it actually was. The bed he had made for a king was instead damaged and covered in graffiti. The bed is now on display in Britain and you are able to visit it. But luckily for both you and the carpenter's ghost, no one is able to sleep in the bed now. Number four, the Terracotta Army. The Terracotta Army is a collection of terracotta sculptures that depict the armies of Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. You know, the one that searched for immortality and ate mercury in an attempt to live forever. Yeah, that one. The statues are a form of art that were buried along with Kinshi, with the purpose of protecting him in his afterlife. The statues were first discovered in 1974 by a group of local farmers. The figures varied in height according to their rank, the tallest being the generals. The figures included warriors, chariots, and horses. There were three pits which held over 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots with 520 horses, and 150 cavalry horses. Most were found in the mausoleum for Qin Shi, but there were also some found in nearby pits that weren't directly in his massive underground grave. The village that the farmers were from believed that if they disturbed the army, they would receive misfortune and bouts of bad luck. Their suspicions were sadly correct, seeing as their 2,000 year old village was destroyed in order to create an enormous museum over the area. I mean, I'd say that's less misfortune and more human idiocy. Just leave well enough alone. You don't need to make everything a spectacle. The extravagant funeral art is available for observation in the museum, and pieces of the army have been sent all over the world. But you should definitely think twice before deciding to visit the exhibit. Bad luck and misfortune are definitely able to spread to curious onlookers. Guys, I know I usually tell you to stay curious, but if you come across someone's funeral art, 
Don't be curious. Turn around and pretend like you never saw it. It's like if you decided to unearth someone's coffin just because you thought it was cool. It's weird. That would be a weird, disrespectful thing to do. Number three, the Hope Diamond. The Hope Diamond is one of the most famous diamonds in the world. The diamond originated in the Kaller Mine in Andhra Pradesh, India. The history of the stone began when a French merchant traveler purchased the diamond, which was triangular in shape and crudely cut. He described the color as a beautiful violet. The stone was then sold to King Louis along with 14 other large diamonds and many smaller ones. The stone was then recut by the court jeweler. It was described by them as an intense steely blue, and the stone became Became known as the blue diamond of the crown or the French blue. It was set in gold and hung from a neck ribbon which was worn by the king on ceremonial occasions. The next king got the diamond reset and then when he and Marie Antoinette attempted to escape France in 1792 the diamond was stolen after being seized by the government. The stone was passed on to many many people being set in different jewelries and headpieces. Eventually the stone would be displayed in several exhibitions for people to view worldwide. In 1958, the diamond was donated to the Smithsonian, quickly becoming the main attraction. Since its donation, the stone has only left the premises four times. Once to the Louvre, once to South Africa at the Rand Easter Show opening, once to Harry Winston, and one other time to clean and restore the diamond. According to legend, the stone is cursed and will bring bad luck and misfortune to anyone who owns it. The curse is said to have come about when the original diamond was stolen stolen from the eye of a statue. The thief who originally stole the stone met a grisly end, and owners of the diamond over the years have followed the same fate, being beheaded, executed, imprisoned, turned bankrupt, and many of their lives have ended abruptly at their own hands and often at someone else's. Since the diamond reached the Smithsonian, there have been no reports of the curse's effects, but I would suggest the only reason for that is no one wears it. I mean, if I got the chance, I have to say, I'd wear it. The thing is beautiful and I would leave this life happy knowing that I had millions of dollars strapped around my neck, glittering and shining in a vibrant blue. Number two, Unlucky Mummy. The Unlucky Mummy is an ancient Egyptian artifact owned by the famous colonizers, the British. More specifically, it lies within the halls of the British Museum. The identity of the original owner is unknown. The artifact is described as a painted wooden mummy board of an unidentified woman and was obtained by the British Museum in 1889. The unlucky mummy is actually not a mummy at all. Instead, it is a gessoed and painted wooden inner coffin lid. It was found at Thebes and has been dated by its shape and style of decoration to the late 21st or the early 22nd dynasty. It is 162 centimeters in length and made of wood and plaster. The paint is placed on the plaster and hands protrude out of the mummy board. A nice 3D moment, you know? Its reputation for misfortune has been told for years, and many attribute large-scale disasters to the presence of the board. One story says the mummy was being moved from the British Museum to New York aboard the, yep, the Titanic, which, as you know, sank. Disclaimers surrounding the mummy's danger have even been published. One writer even conducted research into the history of the artifact, coming to the conclusion that the object had malevolent powers, and guess what? He passed away only three years later. The writer was very young and had no health concerns. His life ended at the mere age of 36. The mummy which the board belonged to has never been found, but many say that it was left in Egypt. I have to say, people keep taking things that don't belong to them, disturbing bodies that had been left undisturbed for thousands of years, and then they act all surprised when the stuff is cursed. I definitely put a curse on the lid of my coffin. Anyone who separates me and my coffin lid, or even pick me up from my resting place to move me into a fluorescent hellscape, would definitely be sentenced to a fate of mediocrity and ignorant greed. Wait, oh my gosh. Anyone who does that is already both of those things. Things are starting to make a lot more sense now. Honestly, I love history, but at the same time, no I don't. I don't need to know the genetic makeup of people 2,000 years ago. That won't help me. People just need to chill on the grave digging. Add that to the list of the top five weirdest, most unsettling things humans do. I could definitely make a highly controversial and opinionated video on that, which would likely get me canceled. It would also be like two hours long. <laughs> 
Number one, Cursed Ledger. A family in Kent donated this haunted book to Brighton's most haunted house, Preston Manor. They donated it after they were plagued by spectral visions and paranormal visitors. The shop ledger is from 1915, but was found trapped in a brick wall at a jeweler while a demolition was being performed in the 1980s. It was discovered by Tony Benjovitz in 1988 when he was demolishing the Shoreland Fuchs shop, which had closed in 1984. He, for some reason, decided to bring the book home and it caused him and his daughter to suffer a myriad of paranormal hauntings, which they described as spirit visitations. His daughter, Josephine, claimed that images appeared in her rug, including a group of men, women, and children, and a soldier with a horse. She said that the spirits told her that the book had to be returned to Brighton for the anniversary of its first entry in December of 1915. The spirits' requests caused Josephine to phone Preston Manor, who sent a medium to visit the house. The medium confirmed that they sensed bad things emanating from it. Wow, specific. Josephine happily donated the ledger to the manor. She had no interest in keeping it to herself or even keeping it in her possession. Fair, I mean, I don't think I would want to keep it either, to be honest. The manor recalled their thoughts about the book, saying, at first, we weren't sure whether we'd take this apparently ordinary 100-year-old shop ledger, but the family impressed on us quite how scared they were of having the book in their keeping. When I had a phone conversation with Josephine, she seemed petrified. The book contained entries listed the jewelry sold from the shop it belonged to. After the book had been donated, Kent, the officer of Preston Manor, kept the ledger on her desk for a couple of weeks, but was unable to understand what exactly had happened to the book. Preston Manor holds several haunted items and is well known for the plethora of ghosts and spectral activities it contains. If you're a fan of getting haunted by the Lady in White or the Grey Lady, those are descriptive names, then you should definitely consider taking a trip to Brighton and Hove, East Sussex, to visit Preston Manor. They absolutely have their share of Victorian ghosts and haunted artifacts. Definitely a lot for the paranormal enthusiasts of the world to enjoy. Number four, Devil's Rocking Chair. I love a good rocking chair. Something soothing about it, you know? All the motion. Very relaxing. Rocking chairs. Rocking on their own, however. No, 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 I don't do that at all. And this one is supposed to be, you know who's personal chair. The Devil's Rocking Chair, which was bought for $67,000 from Ed and Lorraine Warren's site, is in the care of one Zach Baggins. This guy runs a haunted museum in Vegas and purchased the chair understanding fully what it does and is. The chair, originally used in the exorcism of David Glatzel in the 80s by the Warrens themselves, a true case involving murder and demonic possession. A true case. Some have seen a beast sitting in the chair, some have seen a dark shadowy man. And the horrifying part, Baggins had to shut down his exhibit in 2019 because the chair was causing guests to have emotional breakdowns and episodes. One guest even passed out walking directly above the chair on the staircase. Slowly started to become a safety hazard and Zach decided to remove the newest haunted item from his exhibit completely. Before Zach put the rocking chair in his exhibit, he said the only day it was in his home, him and a friend both had a very strange breakdown. Both of them crying uncontrollably and even speaking religious sayings obsessively. Number three, Thomas Busby chair. I thought it would definitely be more like skulls and dolls and stuff, but it seems so far that it's pretty much only furniture holds evil spirits. How about that? Another chair, haunted of course, and this tale is a chilling one. Not like the others aren't. The Thomas Busby Stoop Chair, or also famously known as Dead Man's Chair, is said to be a cursed object from the owner himself, Mr. Busby. This hardwood, allegedly haunted oak chair was cursed by the murderer Thomas Busby before his execution hanging in 1702 in North Yorkshire, England. Thomas Busby was arrested, tried, and condemned to death after he murdered his father-in-law, Daniel Audie, in 1702. Audie and Busby were running a coin counterfeiting business. After an argument about the business, Busby killed Audie. One variation of the story has Busby cursing the chair while on his way to the execution, whereas another says he was drunk in the chair that he was arrested in and cursed it right then and there. 
Due to the many deaths later attributed to people sitting in the chair, the landlord donated it to the Thirsk Museum in the same town where it is having difficulty with guests sitting on top of it. It now stays hung above the floor near the ceiling where no one can even sit on it. That's good. Numerous deaths have been linked to this chair, from soldiers not returning home from war, to delivery drivers crashing their trucks hours later, to people even having strokes and heart attacks sitting in it. Death seems to be intimate anywhere this thing goes. It's been hung up since 2014 and remains there today. Number two, the cursed mirror. Originally sitting in the main foyer in its 17th century antebellum home in Louisiana, this haunted object has been witness to some nasty history. The Myrtles Plantation in Louisiana is the home to deep rooted slavery. The American South is known for its disgusting use of slave labor and would be the home in which this haunted piece sits. The house owned first by Mr. and Mrs. Clark Woodruff. These were racist plantation owners and violent ones at that. It is said that the couple were very sadistic towards abuse of the slaves. A young woman by the name of Chloe was particularly abused when eavesdropping on a conversation Woodruff was having one night, resulting in him cutting both of her ears off. That's so unnecessary. Her mutilation was hidden, but Chloe planned her revenge quickly and decided to poison a cake which Mrs. Woodruff and her two children would be eating. She killed all three of them and was caught, tried, and hanged for her crime. It is Chloe's ghost in which experts say haunts the cursed mirror from the plantation. Ghostly women are seen in the mirror walking by and smudged handprints are always seen even with new trimmings and polished glass. The cursed mirror is believed to have Chloe's spirit trapped inside of it. By gazing into the mirror, evil things apparently would happen resulting in health problems. Weird things happen around this mirror and where it lays now, that's Ed and Lorraine's business. Ed and Lorraine are taking care of it, of course, thank God, and it sits in the couple's occult museum in Connecticut ungazable. Today the Myrtles Plantation has been changed into a bed and breakfast, but still remains one of America's most haunted houses. What do you think? And coming in at number one, Annabelle. Possibly the most infamous and dangerous possessed artifact found at the home of Ed and Lorraine Warren. Their occult museum is the home of the Annabelle doll. We know a little bit about this doll, of course, with all the films about her in the last couple years. Tons of people have flocked to the museum to take pics in front of her vase. She rests inside a glass case ominously marked warning. Positively do not touch. Warned. She was previously owned by a nursing student, Donna, in 1970. Gifted from her mother from a thrift store. After some creepy incidents involving Involving the doll like levitating onto the table and moving around by itself, she took the doll to a medium who revealed it is possessed by the spirit of a little girl who died young. Ed and Lorraine were eventually called after the incidents would not stop and they offered to take it to their home. However, this is the scary part on the drive home. Ed himself said that the doll was making the car do things out of his control. Stuffed in a bag, doused in holy water, he still felt the presence. The engine kept turning off, power steering would all of a sudden lock up. The hardest part was getting it into a safe locked case in their museum where it's been ever since. Thank goodness. The doll holds evil power and demonic possession, Lorraine says, and she refuses to even make eye contact with it. Yeah, you know it's bad when they won't even look it in the eye, huh? The museum unfortunately has been shut down since 2019, but the cursed objects still seem to be staying put. Thank goodness. Number five on this list is the British Museum. The British Museum has a super haunted item in it that is said to be somewhat responsible for the death of hundreds of individuals. The unlucky mummy. Museum Crush says not actually a mummy but the mummy board or coffin lid of an unknown high status woman from the 21st or 22nd dynasty. The British Museum's unlucky mummy has earned quite the reputation for causing destruction through its ancient curse. The mysterious mummy was found at Thebes in the late 1800s and tales of its curse start soon after that. It's said that of the four young Englishmen who bought it, two died in shooting incidents and two died in poverty. A string of illnesses, accidents, and deaths following this are said to be attributed to the mummy. One of the most astonishing rumors surrounding the mummy's curse is that it caused the sinking of the Titanic with the loss of more than 1,500 lives. One of the victims on the Titanic was journalist William Thomas Steed, who was one of the first to pen articles about the mummy's curse. Survivors from the disaster recall Steed telling stories of the ominous artifact over dinner, and as the mummy's sinister reputation grew, people even began to believe that its presence on on board caused the disaster. Now I will say this, there was no actual record of the mummy being on the Titanic. I mean, 
mean think about it. If it was, then how could it be in the museum right now? It would be at the bottom of the ocean. So we know that it was never actually there, but that didn't stop it from cursing the boat all the same. It's believed that Steed carried this curse onto the ship, and that the telling of these stories are what ultimately cursed the ship to begin with. Almost as if bringing up the mummy multiple times in a row unleashed its power. For my sake, I really hope that this isn't the case though. Pretty sure I've talked about this mummy a few times before on this channel, and if this is like a Beetlejuice thing, like say it so many times and then it happens, then I could be in for some trouble. Number four on this list is the Royal Museum's Greenwich. So apparently the Queen's house in the museum actually has a cursed piece of architecture built into it. Museum Crush says, rather a large object, the tulip staircase of the Queen's house of Royal Museum's Greenwich lays claim to being the first geometric self-supporting spiral stair in Britain and is rightly regarded as one of the great features of the former royal residence. But it is also the location of the Rev R. W. Hardy's famous ghost photograph. The retired Canadian vicar and his wife visited the house in 1966 and like many people before and since happily snapped away at the elegant spiral of stairs. But it wasn't until they returned to British Columbia and developed their films that they noticed a scarily cloaked spectral figure climbing the stairs. Subsequent investigations into both stairs and photograph have thrown no further light on the unearthly mystery, although as recently as 2002, a member of staff reported seeing a ghostly figure cross a balcony of the stairway before disappearing in time-honored ghostly fashion through a wall. I guess you could argue the staircase isn't necessarily an item, but who cares? The museum is still as haunted as ever, and maybe even more so. At least with other museums that have haunted or cursed items, the curse just pertains to that object. And usually if you don't touch the object or interact with it, you should be fine. Just walking around this place, and especially going up or down the stairs, carries a pretty heavy risk to it. Be very careful around the stairs at the Queen's house if you ever end up going. Number three on this list is the Thirsk Museum. Located in Yorkshire Museum, Museum, this tiny little quaint museum is the last place you would expect to see something haunted. Enter in the Busby Stoop chair. Museum Crush says, Yorkshire drunk, criminal, and coin counterfeiter Thomas Busby murdered his father-in-law and fellow counterfeiter Daniel Autie in 1702. Busby was arrested at the local inn and sentenced to death by hanging. According to legend, he laid a curse on his favorite chair at the inn, saying death would come soon to anyone who dared sit in his seat. After his execution, his remains were hung in a gibbet from a stoop at Sand Hutton Crossroads, now the location of the Busby Stoop Inn. The inn and surrounding area were said to be haunted by Busby's ghost, but one chair there in particular had developed a rather sinister reputation following a string of tragic accidents. Second World War airmen who sat in the chair were said to never return from their missions, and the chair also linked to several road accidents and fatal illnesses. In 1978, the inn's landlord removed the chair to Thirsk Museum just a few miles down the road. The chair is now suspended high above the ground at the museum to ensure that no unassuming soul can ever fall foul of its curse again. It's been hung there, unmoved, for 40 years. I've looked into this chair further, and for a while there, it really was that if you sat in this thing, you were going to die. It wasn't going to happen in a year from now or something like that either. Like, we're talking about pretty imminent death here. Number two on this list is the Natural History Museum. The Natural History Museum is one of the most complete museums in the world, and being so complete, it obviously has to include a cursed item. Museum Crush says, this apparently cursed gem was owned by 19th century polymath Edward Heron Allen. So powerful was its curse that he eventually decided to have it stored away in a bank vault inside seven locked boxes with a note of warning to anyone who dare handle it. Heron Allen also left strict instruction not to remove the amethyst until 33 years after his death. The curious story surrounding the stone says that it was stolen from the temple of the god Indra during the Indian mutiny by Colonel W. Ferris, an officer of the Bengal cavalry. After Ferris's health deteriorated and he died, the cursed amethyst was passed on to his son, who suffered a similar
similar bout of bad luck and eventually gave it to Heron Allen. After facing a string of health and financial misfortunes, Heron Allen made several attempts to get rid of the stone, but they all proved unsuccessful each time it returned to him. Less than a year after his death, Heron Allen's daughter donated the amethyst to the Natural History Museum, where it is on display in the vault. And finally, number one on this list is Zach Baggins Haunted Museum. The number one voted haunted place in America has got to make this list, considering it's full of cursed objects. There isn't just one object here that's cursed, there are tons. In fact, we would need our own separate video dedicated solely to this place to even begin to break down all the scary stuff that's in this museum. Just listen to this small excerpt from the website. Among the hundreds of terrifying possessions, museum goers can even peek inside the VW death van in which Dr. Jack Kevorkian ended the suffering of terminally ill patients, as well as get a close-up look at the propofol chair from Michael Jack Jackson's death room. Perhaps most unsettling is the original staircase from the Indiana Demon House, notorious for its powerful paranormal activity before being demolished in 2014. The wooden banister and creaky steps from the house now stand in a dimly lit corner, resting on a blanket of dirt from the location. Following its installation, a group of construction workers walked off the job and refused to come back. These are just a couple of the so-called attractions that this place has to offer. If you go to this museum, then there is a very good chance you will end up walking out with a curse attached to you. That much paranormal energy all lumped into one place, it just spells out something haunted. Be very careful.